Hi, and welcome to Scientist Warning TV. Um, today, I'm really pleased to have with me Dr. James Dyke, a global systems scientist from the University of Exeter, and Dr. Wolfgang Knorr, a climate scientist from the University of Lund. And um, recently, they authored a controversial article that questions the basis of net zero, which was published in the conversation. Um, and has gone viral as over 1 million downloads so far and counting, I, I believe. So welcome, James and Wolfgang. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Um, Wolfgang, I'd like to start with you, if I may, and, and just ask you, what prompted you to write the paper in the first place? Um, you know, was there something about net zero that just didn't stack up for you? Well, for all three of you. Okay. Um... It, essentially, I I had first contact with the concept of net zero back in 2009, and I caused a paper where we made this point, and maybe as, as one of the first, actually, that to stabilize the climate, at some point, we will have to go net zero. Um, at that time, we didn't have these uh, ambitious climate targets. Uh, as we have now. Um, so it wasn't really on the table at, the, at that time. And what we said in that article, and we didn't call it net zero, we just talked about compensating any kind of small remaining sources sometime in the future by what we call an artificial sink. And that kind of side remark of that paper within these like, 12 years until uh, since it has been published, got blown up now to this huge topic of net zero. And that really small kind of artificial sink that we were talking about in, in that publication back then, now because of IPCC reports and, and the logic of us just ramping up our emissions in that, mean, in that time has become huge mm -hmm. and it has become basically blown out of any proportions uh, um, that, that are sort of logical or basically what what the IPCC report on meeting the Paris Agreement's goal of 1.5 degree warming was saying is that we have to turn our society from one that emits carbon massively to, to one that sucks up carbon from the atmosphere massively, almost mm. you know, to, to the, the same extent. And that's really like science fiction. I, I, I don't think anybody ever believed that would be possible. But nobody really wanted to talk, to, talk about that, that mm. we have um, very authoritative reports and they create a scenario that is completely unbelievable Nobody really believes in it, but that thing doesn't get discussed. But it has very tangible results in policy mm. and in, in politicians' statement. And you get the impression that the politicians aren't really aware of that kind of cognitive dissonance that is created there. Okay. Um, but the starting point really is a simple scientific observation that we have to balance sources and sinks. Mm -hmm. And that, that is actually true. The problem is that we, well, we've, we've come to a point where um, it's not realistic that we can actually do it. Okay. So it's almost as if net zero has been invented as something um, that now has to do all the heavy lifting. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Now, James, um, you have a couple of years ago produced a, a film, a short film on the climate crisis, which is which is really incredibly informative. And and I noticed that in it at that point, you were saying we've tried everything except mitigation. And and I wondered how you feel as a as a, a global system scientist, you know, year in, year out, hearing the same rhetoric and then having to hope that the actions will follow. And then seeing recently that the pledges have followed, that the pledges have been ramped up. But as everyone says, there's still pledges. So how do, how does it feel as a you know within the scientific community year in year out to be experiencing this and yet just not seeing the the necessary actions following through? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think the current situation we are in is one 
I don't think real peril. I think we're in a very dangerous situation because we are at risk of slipping into a form of complacency based mm. on some recent announcement announcements of increased ambition. And it's strange, you know, it, it seems that many people normally would be quite sceptical of political commitments, political promises. You know, we're all cynical when it comes to, you know, not really believing what politicians say. Mm. They'll they'll make a whole series of pledges in order to get elected. And then we just take it for granted that when they're in office, they don't necessarily follow through. But now we seem to be in a situation where we are, you know, receiving with open arms the most fantastic, fabulous promises for future technological salvation from our current generation of politicians. And we're doing that relatively uncritically. Mm -hmm. So now we can say, or some reports are saying that we are on course for, you know, maybe a little bit above two degrees Celsius by the end of this century. And then with further ambition, maybe at this new COP26 mm -hmm. that's going to be later this year, um, we, we're going to see warming uh, well below two degrees and therefore Paris is still within reach, you know. And it's the most fantastic nonsense. Nobody believes that. No one thinks that we're on course uh, to limit warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, even with the enormous amounts of negative emissions which are being mm. postulated up and running by the middle of this century. So something really interesting is going on here. Is it another kind of example of the sort of discourses of delay? Previously, it was you know, well, the climate's not warming and then it was warming, but it's not warming very much or it is warming very much, but it's not us. OK, it is us, but there's nothing to worry about. OK, it is us. There's something to worry about and we're going to do something about it. OK, we're going to do something about it, but not now. Hence mm -hmm. the, the kind of the, the sort of the mid-century pledges, you know, net zero by 2050. And I've become increasingly um, worried that that's actually what is happening. Yes, there has been some increase in ambition in, for example, the United Kingdom and the United States when you regard or when you compare it to their previous pledges, mm -hmm. but it's still woefully inadequate. And it's also almost entirely divorced from what's going on in the rest of the world where we're seeing you know, more coal-fired power stations being built, more oil and gas uh, exploration, more hydrocarbons that are going to get extracted and, and burnt more assumptions that we're going to have baked in uh, economic growth and therefore ever increasing rates of energy and material consumption. So it's a weird, weird time where there seems to be this huge disconnect between what's being presented in the policy context and what seems to be demanded if we are going to avoid, you know, climate and ecological disaster. Mm, okay. Um, I mean, one of the most interesting things for me has been the very fact that this article has really cut through, you know, one million views um, including one from a very um, famous person. So Greta, you know, Greta has been a real champion of this, and she's really recognised that the, there's a key message in this article that has not been spoken about enough. And so she talks about it as one of the most important and informative texts she's ever read on the climate and ecological crisis. Um, and she she's tweeted it several times. So clearly with the younger people, it's resonated. But I wonder about the scientific community. I mean, what kinds of reactions have you been getting to this article? It's been overwhelmingly positive. So that's either been in public, where there's been lots of kind of supportive tweets and retweets and messages, but then also many supportive messages in private, where I've got a lot of emails from people that I know, people I've never met, who mm. uh, kind of congratulate us on the article, but with the sentiment that they're really glad that somebody said this at last, that mm. they feel that we've, we're saying something really important, something that needs to be said. There needs to be maybe a readjustment of this narrative. Um, so that's been, that's been great. And there's also been some pushback, which isn't surprising at all. Mm. It's a controversial article. I mean, the, the title, we don't write the titles, <laughs> but the title was, um, I mean, so up editors, sub editors write article titles and they do that because they're really good at it because they generate interest. And it did, mm -hmm. right, because it's, you know, even the concept is a trap. And that's uh, been pushed back by some people. And I think there's some fair discussion about that. And to what extent is, is the very idea of net zero dangerous? There's been some sort of circling of the wagons in academia mm -hmm. because a significant section of academia is entirely vested in the notion of net zero, is entirely vested in the way in which we're producing policy in this kind of existing climate policy um, system. Mm. 
And, you know, it wasn't very subtle, it wasn't much of a subtext, it pretty much was the argument in our article that that's fundamentally broken, it's not working, something radically different needs to happen. And so if you've been spending years or decades of your life working in that system, working really hard, trying to make improvements, um, trying to trying to do the things that you know need to be done, mm -hmm. then I, I would imagine that kind of criticism is going to be quite hard to take and could be construed as being um, almost like an attacking, you know, undermining mm -hmm. um, these attempts, undermining the, our colleagues. And that certainly wasn't our intention. Mm -hmm. But I think anything less would have been easy to ignore. It wouldn't have cut through as much. And the situation that we're currently in, we urgently need to talk about these things. Mm, absolutely. Um, I was I was struck by uh, Catherine Hayhoe's response, in fact. It's a very measured and a very sensible response. Um, and she comments on seeing the provocative title and didn't think that she'd agree with it. But then she says that she read it carefully and turns out, much as I wish I didn't, I do agree with them, particularly with regard to the difficult truth section at the end. So it's it's clearly surfacing something within scientists themselves, I think, that it's actually really hard for them to to face and to mm. to look at. Wolfgang, do you have any any thoughts on the responses to from the scientific community to the article? I um, well, I, I'd like largely like to second what what James has said. Um, one one thing that I observed also is that. Um, part of the way we, we wrote it from a kind of very personal perspective, from a historical perspective, went down very well with some older colleagues, some of them retired already, who really thanked us uh, for rolling this, kind of rolling this out again, the kind of the, the hopes and desperation and, and the sort of the different emotional stages uh, people have been going through in, in within 30 years, uh, because, that's because that's about how long the story has been going on. Mm. And um, that, that was, that, that I thought was really, really nice to hear that, you know, that you, you can talk about your feelings as a scientist, the, the kind of emotional stages you go through in your career publicly, which is kind of new, new thing for many, many people, it seems like, which I mm. found was quite nice. Um, another thing was, uh, there was one attempt on Twitter to sort of um, empirically shoot our hypothesis down, that is uh, net zero is, is um, leading to less ambition. Mm -hmm. um, one scientist, he was looking at the short term targets of countries. And he observed actually that those countries have these kind of distant net zero targets they have actually increased their short-term ambition also. So at first sight, that would actually look like it, it, it contradicts what we're saying, that you no know, net zero is an excuse not to do anything. However, if you look at it a bit more closely, is that, for example, these short-term targets aren't really always kept. Germany, for example, um, would have failed its own target uh, last year, hadn't been for the pandemic. <laughs> and, and nobody ever talks about these short-term targets. They're called NDCs. Who's ever heard of the NDCs? Net zero is all over, over the place nowadays. Mm. So it doesn't cost anything politically to ramp them up. Mm. So it's just logical that the countries who are more, who come up with these distant goals also ramp their completely cost-free short-term targets. So I would actually th think that that observation supports our theory. So that kind of highlights the difficulty of mm -hmm. the discussion and, it's, it's, and, and also why it's probably not being discussed that much because it, it kind of evades the simple kind of empirical approaches that we scientists are so used to. You really have to look at the psychology of it and, and the messaging and, okay. and, and the com communication between politicians and the public and all this. Okay. I think that's, I mean, that's, that's interesting, just hearing that whole array of kind of responses that you've had to this. Um, I want to move on now. So, you know, over the decades, we've, we've had warnings and hard as it is to admit, the warnings clearly aren't, aren't working. 
We've had decades of scientists explaining what needs to happen. And we've now got a, a powerful movement of young people who are basically calling out the failings of governments and you know the, the failings as they, as they see it um, for governments to take action. Um, and there's a sense in which the young people have become the adults in the room because they're not buying these fantasies about carbon offsets and they're not buying the fantasies around net zero. And they're not buying this notion that um, the governments have it in hand when clearly they don't. Um, so Wolfgang, just staying with you, I mean, do scientists really believe these fantasies? And if they don't, what does that mean for the Paris Agreement? Well, this, this is really the problem and the, the strange situation that in private, we said that in the article, we struggle to name any scientist who would actually have believed even in 2015, not, not in 2021, that the Paris Agreement was possible. And that we, we, we would be able to sort of engineer ourselves out uh, of the problem in, in, in the future with some kind of unproven technology and all of these things. But they don't say it. We don't, we don't usually go public with this knowledge because, you know, we, partly because we're stuck in, in everyday life. Uh, we have to write a grant applications, review papers and teach and all this stuff. So it, and, and we, we're stuck in this, this academic world where you're allowed to say certain things and, and then other, other things are perceived to be activist, a little bit too mm -hmm. political. And so there is this divide between what, what's being said privately and what's being said in publications and, and teaching and, 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 and so on. And, and obviously, people mm. like Greta, they're not bound to that. Mm. And, and one, one particular thing that has really, it is, has really been a problem for me and it's actually been instrumental of, for, you know, for me to, for, for the fact that I've been moving out of academia more and more myself, is that, that kind of cognitive dissonance be, between calling the climate crisis a crisis or emergency and just going on about our daily lives. Mm. And Greta, Greta, she, re, she really gets it. She says, I mean, even after all these emergency declarations by the UK parliament, the EU parliament, uh, local councils and universities themselves and so on and so on, she just says, well, you don't treat it a crisis like a crisis and as long as you don't treat a crisis like a crisis that's what she said on a podcast on Swedish uh, radio um, there's not going to be a solution and that mm. really is the adult in the room and and we can only I mean, at, at the present moment it's it's really hard to, to swallow that but you know we can only as scientists we can only learn from her at the moment and that's really a terrible situation as she says herself that kind of burden put on her. I mean, she's mm -hmm. talking to some US committee recently, it was on The Guardian. She's talked to the UN, to the EU Parliament, all these things. I mean, and, and every time she does that, she says, I shouldn't be the one doing this. It's ridiculous. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's really true. And that really has to end. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, and, and we, we made, it, made a really small step with this article, hopefully, in that direction, but I think it's, 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 there's a lot more to do. Yeah, I'm only agree. only the beginning, and and yeah. and I'm I'm really a big fan of Greta. I have to say that, and we've really heard it already. And um, yeah. I can only hope that we as scientists can can move into that direction. And I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And I think you know you touch you touch there on academia and. You know, one of the things that has, has intensely frustrated me over the past couple of years, and particularly since I've since I left academia, um, is its unwillingness to tackle the difficult problems. And that's the case whether you're in academia or whether whether you've left. And so, for example, um, over seven thousand universities and colleges globally now have declared a climate emergency. But interestingly, the the three point plan is basically about getting their estates in order. It's basically about achieving net zero in terms of their operations, but nowhere are they actually looking at what could be seen as their role in per perpetuating the crisis. Um, and there are numerous examples where, you know, we, we, we see in the press, for example, that, um, students calling out 
um, say Cambridge University and others because they're still um, tied to fossil fuels. And there's been sort of long, torturous processes where universities have been, you know, they've had to sort of grudgingly extricate themselves from those situations. Now, how do you see academia in terms of taking, the shouldering its responsibility for its part in arguably perpetuating the crisis? Academic institutions, just like many institutions, maybe most, nearly all institutions, mm. on the one hand want to say it's a climate and ecological emergency, and on the other, they want to carry on business as usual. Mm. Um, and that's understandable I mean if you're a if you're a private company if you're a corporation if you if you've got to you know generate return um shareholder return on value and things like this you know your your your, your mission as an organization mm. is to generate profits mm. right you might like to think that universities and educational institutions would be a bit more enlightened about what their objective is but there are still certainly in the UK higher education sector some pretty hard bottom lines you know mm. student numbers grant income uh, league table performance things like mm. this um, relatively small number of metrics which vice chancellors and the senior management team are measured by mm. are, are progress through their career by that continue to dictate and drive the sector and then when you look down there at where the climate and ecological emergency kind of collides with that and you can see there's going to be very very big problems because mm. if you've got an institution that's meant to be increasing numbers or increasing numbers of students from overseas or increasing grant it's all about more right find me a vice chancellor that actually wants to decrease the size of their university decrease student numbers decreased not just total emissions but you know total environmental footprint uh, footprint and then at the same time as reorient that institution in ways which could provide some of the solutions some of the new knowledge to lead us mm. out of this potential disaster and it's i don't know i mean i can think of maybe a number of small sort of independent institutions right mm. but when it comes to mainstream universities i don't think really any have changed their fundamental practices mm. Yeah, Wolfgang, I mean, I'm just thinking about that in terms of the responsibility, if you like, the obligation that um, duty of care the institutions have to those young students who are going to be starting in autumn on courses that may be, you know, that will lead to careers that could be obsolete in a few years time. Uh, is that something that, that crosses your radar at all? What, what I tend to see be, being at Lund University, which is very strong in kind of sustainable development studies. And mm. it's, it's, it's actually one of Europe's major universities. It's, it's, I think it's got 34,000 students. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a university that is exceedingly rich, actually. It's, and, and it kind of has this feeling of being a vanguard in kind of sustainable development studies. And many your petroleum engineering example is a good one because it's so blatantly obvious. Mm. But, but the difficult one might actually come in when you when you start kind of questioning also the role of sustainability studies. And that is that is something I felt quite a lot, and I guess as being being a, a climate scientist. And um, it is it is really there, and it's where it is it is really this kind of um, almost obligation to sound positive and solution oriented mm -hmm. all the time, and not having really much time to kind of sit back, reflect about on the situation, which is really forced on you mainly through, I think mainly through grant applications, you, you, because grant applications are always about solutions. So you have to, mm -hmm. in Sweden, you, when you have standard grant applications, you have to list how they will contribute to, to the um, sustainable uh, development goals. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of programmed in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that actually, in my view, creates some problems because it, it makes it all I mean you have some instruments there you've got models or whatever and then you have to think about how can that then help the sustainable development goals but it it may not 
modeling might yeah. just be the totally yeah. wrong tool. We might actually rather want to listen to indigenous people who have lived mm -hmm. sustainably for thousands and even tens of thousands of years, uh, rather than build models. And it might be a waste of time, but I just happen to have models. It's, um, I, I work from my computer. Um, there might be not that much money for expeditions <laughs> or whatever. You know, it's, it's, sometimes it's completely practical and you just have to work with what you have. And then you end up in this kind of ivory tower where you talk about something because it was kind of forced on you by grant application. You can't even be honest and say, I, I, I want the money, even though this is not having sustainable development. Yeah, you it's, have to it's pretend it does. It's it, there's a kind of mismatch, isn't there, between you know the kinds of problems that uh, and things that um, academics are constrained to focus on by virtue of the way that the systems are set up and and what they arguably should be focused on. So exactly. you know, it's almost like a reification of knowledge as opposed to wisdom, which is how absolutely like Nick Maxwell put it. Can yeah, I? Yeah. I just I just want to move on. Um, so the Net Zero articles made this enormous splash, which is fantastic. Um, it's, it's got people talking. What, what would you like to see happen next? What do you think, what do you think should happen next? What do, you, what do you want to see happening as a result? Maybe I'll start with James. Well, we need to talk about it. So I think we've, we've provided a space in which we can we can reflect on the plausibility, the feasibility, the credibility of some of the plans, some of the pledges and the promises which are being presented to us as solutions, you know, the way out uh, of the current crisis. The danger was that these, as, as time progresses, the 1.5 budget becomes smaller and smaller. It's practically non-existent already, but in a few years when it's effectively gone, Carbon dioxide removal technologies are only, they're just going to increase proposed carbon dioxide removal technologies. That, you know, um, they'll just increase the removal term in their simple equations or in their very, very complex models. Um, and they're just going to lead us towards, you know, towards the cliff edge. So we need, we urgently need that kind of discussion right now. And we kind of got to, we've sort of got to stop doing that. And then we need to face the facts of the matter of where we are right now. Mm. Um, the severity of the situation but then also what's driven us to this place so one of the things we're trying to get out in the article is try to understand or unpick the dysfunctions in this climate policy system mm. this sort of 30-year um, history of repeated failure so net zero is just kind of the latest manifestation of a climate policy system that continually is um, unable to deliver what we need which is just mitigation right urgently mm reducing the amount of fossil fuels and we can't do it the climate policy system can't do it now opinions about that will differ i would take a kind of a growth perspective and the reason it can't do that is because it's absolutely baked into the assumption of continual economic growth and continual uh, growth in energy material consumption so it's no mm -hmm. wonder you're not going to see reductions in emissions right because mm -hmm. the system is just getting larger over time but whichever kind of position you start with or assumptions or particular acts you've got to grind this is the thing we need to talk about and then we need to talk about the role of academia in that because at the moment academia and academics are being subsumed into that system whereby you're only really allowed to say a, a relatively small number of things within that kind of cli climate policy system you've got to adhere to an incrementalist market-based approach mm. kind of can't rock the boat and also a strange form of self-censorship where you can't be you know you can't be doomist or um, defeatist you've got to be continually optimistic and upbeat about all the kind of things that we can fix so there's a space there's a space which is between um well acknowledging that there's something deeply wrong with how we're producing climate policy and how we're responding but it's also not assuming that we're doomed right there's there's mm. a middle way right mm. and the middle way is basically to reflect on why we continue to get this thing wrong and then work on that right and we don't have much time to do it and you might think that's an impossible task we wouldn't even know to where, where to begin but what is incredibly frustrating is that isn't that one of the jobs that academia should be doing it should be generating new knowledge and ways of understanding our world and you know and if we're not going to do it who is it's not going to be shell 
or BP mm. or mm. national governments because they're all entirely wedded to a business as usual approach, right? Mm. So somehow we need to take back that narrative. We need to rediscover a little bit of bravery and not be afraid of stepping into um, an area of debate which typically um, academics have been excluded from. Mm. Because I think there's an important role that academics are playing, which is essentially tacit agreement to something which they know and they do know is deeply wrong. Maybe we'll talk about that that particular examples of dissonance later, but I think that's where the discussion needs to go next. Mm. Okay, I think that's really interesting. And you're right, there is a sense in which in academia, acad academics work in their silos, and it's long been acknowledged that that's problematic, and yet and yet they still exist. And so there's a sense in which um, the problem belongs with the climate scientists, whereas in fact, I think what you're saying is that we need much more of a interdisciplinary, post-disciplinary kind of um, approach to this, and importantly, to have that conversation. Um, Wolfgang, I'm just going to look to you to some final words on, on that particular subject. What do you think needs to happen next? I, I think... Yeah, I, I think we need some kind of wake-up process and that should probably start with a redirection of the current discussion. And it really goes back to the question what progress is. Mm. Um, at, at the moment, what it looks like is almost like a situation where you have a patient that has three doctors and they can't agree on the cure. And the patient gets sicker and sicker and sicker. And now the, the doctors can agree. They, they, okay, you get this, the blue pill. And, and mm. that's progress. At the moment, we, we're kind of thinking that's progress, but in you know we have all these pledges and we have more and more pledges. We're ramping up the ambition, but the CO2 in the atmosphere gets higher and higher. We go in closer and closer to the cliff edge, as, as James is, is saying. So we have to get out of this current almost fake optimism we have. Mm -hmm. We we should we, we need a much more adult conversation about climate change and not being too jubilant about you know it's not that these these new pledges are bad but we should not get carried away which is not an adult conversation but what we should really do is look at the situation acknowledge the fact that every year CO two levels and greenhouse gas levels rise in the atmosphere is, is getting worse not better you know? and and we can only start sort of saying okay we made progress once CO2 levels in the atmosphere go down and that's going to be really really long way to go and and we have to acknowledge that mm. and the other thing is yeah as you just said what we need to look at the blocks to action and why we're not doing it and that for example, I could think of very practical um, suggestion. We need to reform the IPCC because the IPCC structure is physical system first, then mitigation and then adaptation kind of separate. And, and, and the, the, there is so much energy put in understanding the physical system and the glaciers and, and, and the sea level rise and, and then impacts on, on ecosystem, all that. But there's a minuscule amount of work getting well, invested into the reflection of why our system doesn't perform. You know, we, we just say, okay, we need political will and they sort it all out, but that's not true. There is a very incredibly complex system mm -hmm. of, of uh, different actors there that has to be navigated. It, it, it's hellishly complex. And, and we... And you know, for, for example, we have to realize that n no action on climate change will ever happen without broad buy-in by citizens. And that's not even discussed. So a reform of the IPCC could actually be a starting point and then we turn it all in head. We start with the human system and then the climate system is kind of a symptom of the crisis. Mm. That would be my suggestion. That's but interesting. That's, Sorry, I'll James. Just, but that's really interesting, right? Because... It's no surprise that the IPCC has evolved like that because by putting so much emphasis on trying to understand climate sensitivity, by trying to, by trying to, I mean, there's just continual papers which are all about determining how big the budget is. It's smaller, it's larger, it's smaller, it's larger, and that's the only thing that policymakers seem to want. You know, how much time can they buy in order to be able to do the decarbonisation? Mm -hmm. And absolutely no critical reflection on the on the drivers that have brought us to the place. Mm -hmm. And also, 
maybe one of the big mistakes the IPCC had was including the kind of um, potential mitigation scenarios, which are all about economic assumptions and assumptions about how societies are meant to function. And we kind of mentioned that in the article, you know, they're the sort of IPC scenarios um, or the, the kind of modeling scenarios that the IPCC use are all based on a really, really narrow perspective or an interpretation of how societies are meant to act. And if anything, you can understand them as effectively ruling out the kind of large scale rapid response, which is the only thing that's gonna get us out of the mess, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a, it's a sort of a toxic system which has evolved, which has kind of captured academia, captured academics, subsumed us entirely in this system, which, I mean, I don't want to sound conspiratorial about it, but a, a system that's almost been designed in order to stop doing the effective action because it will only ever allow incremental market-based change. It will only essentially accept a solution which perpetuates business as usual, continual economic growth. Mm. And that could be a recipe for disaster, right? Mm. Absolutely. Um, well, here's hoping. <laughs> I feel a bit silly saying it. You know, I mean, here's hoping it doesn't. But, you know, I mean, we, we look at where we are. You know, it, it, the situation does look pretty desperate. And it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that you know people like Greta are shouting from the rooftops, um, and it's you know it's quite it's quite humbling I think for all of us to see her and all those young people doing that. I mean we're all we're all parents, one well, of the three of us here are parents. Um, okay, so that's possibly not the most optimistic note to end on, but I mean it's been really interesting talking with with you both. So thank you both so much for your time. <laughs>